Well, I feel that I've been put in between a rock and a hard place. I have a tired audience, and I have to follow two eloquent speakers. So uh, I kind of feel on edge in a way. But <laughs> my, uh, I think that a neglected aspect that we have not touched upon is like, for me, in my experience in chewing coca, is a tremendous pleasure and sense of well-being that it gives you. So I like through the art related to coca to try and emphasize the pleasurable aspects of coca, which I think is, to me, is the high attraction that it does. I mean, I shoot a lot of kilos of leaves, so, but it always doesn't fail to bring up I don't know, the best thing me, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Uh, so here is a leaf, same leaf, back and forth, showing the typical kind of parallel venation that it has. Uh, I don't like to call anything sacred, because if you call anything sacred, I agree with William Blake, everything is sacred. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, why, why should be here sacred and over here not sacred? Uh, everything is sacred. You know, it's the way I think. So let's uh, get me the first the next slide. Okay, so let me, this is the usual classification accepted today of coca. Uh, two species with two varieties each uh, Bolivian coca and Ipadu, Amazonian coca, this is Ipadu, uh, and uh, Novo Granadense, Colombian coca, and Trujillo coca. Uh, let me show you a few photos of of the plant, so that you kind of become a little familiar with it. May I have the next one? There, there is coca, it gets so intense, it's like total surface of leaves, no, no space practically in between. Yeah, next one, there with this beautiful deep red fruit. Okay. Next one, please. And really gorgeous flowers. Next, and this, this, and it's a plant that is one of those miracle plants. It's like, like ayahuasca. You don't have to do anything to it. It just grows. Uh, you don't have to put fertilizer on it, insecticides. It, it just grows beautifully. It's like those plants that you see in science fiction stories sometimes when the aliens come and say, here, plant this. This is going to help you out. And the plant just grows all over rocks and whatever. And that's been my experience with uh, trying to grow uh, ayahuasca or trying to grow coca. It just grows. It doesn't need me. It, it just goes by itself, really. It, it's my experience. And it's, you know, and it's a gorgeous bush. Yeah, next one. Okay, this is how generally you buy it in the market in Bolivia and in northern Chile in these green bags. Many of you that might have been in La Paz, you know the section in the La Paz market uh, that has a whole section of selling coca with a green canopy, a green toldos that chew and you can smell it a block away. Uh, so generally, you know, what, I, what we do much, you just buy, this is a quarter kilo. A quarter kilo that lasts a reasonable time. You know. uh, in, in, yeah. And I, I never experienced any ill feelings. And then uh, when I spend three months over there and I just go home, I don't miss it when I go home. There's no sense of dependence or any of it. You know. So next one. So I wanted to, <laughs> yeah. So it's a really beautiful thing. Uh, so. I wanted to just show you the pleasure that coca gives you through the art that it has provoked. Okay. Is I think my best way of handling this now. Let me have the next one. Well, well, this is uh, the, again the same branch. They place on a scanner and scan them and then stitch them in Photoshop. And underneath is gypta. Gypta is the alkaline substance that you use while chewing coca. It's sometimes manufactured from ashes from a vegetable source or from calcined shells compressed to make a cake. It, it, for amateurs like me, it burns a lot. It's, if it drops out of the quid, it, it just feels like it's gonna perforate your cheek. So what the best way to do it for 
and outside of, of a native culture is you build your creed slowly while having a conversation with friends over the table, which I think is a feature of, of coca, is this ability to, to uh, emphasize conversation. And then gradually you build your quid, soften the leaves until you have a quid that you feel comfortable with. And then you introduce the yipta. Many people today in cities like in the northwest of Argentina where the leaves are legal, they sell you the bag already with a, with a packet of sodium bicarbonate inside. So that you, instead of using yipta, you use sodium bicarbonate. Uh, the problem with sodium bicarbonate when you're going to do sustained chewing is when you're, when you're getting up in age, like me, I don't think having such heavy intake of sodium is, is the best thing to do. But it, it's easy, it, yeah, it's easy, I guess what you would say, but I always fear for my blood pressure when I, not because of the coca, but because of the sodium bicarbonate. You know? But they sell you, you see in Northwest Argentina, when you get out of the city of Salta, kids are selling, they have these things of wire with their little bags hanging on them, and they just scream, coca y vica. You know, you, you think, well, it's a soft drink that they're selling, <laughs> coca y vica, and they sell it to you. They're a dollar, a, a dollar a bag, and if you, buy, if you buy, pay a little more, they sell you the higher quality leaf as, as you go. And it's, it, it's legal all through Tucumán, Salta, Jujuy, uh, which are the three main cities of the Argentine Northwest. And, uh, and it's, it's a big market on it, of course, for drivers. When you get out, you see the truck drivers buying it. And, okay. and you know, one time I had a really funny thing with a policeman, because I mean, I'm, you're used to illegalities. So I was driving and chewing, and the cops came, and I hit my coca under the seat, and he just cracked up. You know, he started laughing at me and making fun of me. He said, you don't have to hide it. It's OK here, you know. But, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was, you know, automatic mechanisms of being used to illegalities. You know, so you hit the thing. You know. yeah. So the next one, please. So this is the, the oldest sites of archaeological coca. The oldest one so far is at Namchok in northern Peru, where they found coca in domestic settings at, at 8,000 years ago. And, and this is excavation by Tom Dillehe, who, who is the person that also has had the oldest human activity in, in the Americas. He has excavated sites way down in northern Chile at 17,000 years ago. It's been challenged a lot, but still, his excavations are solid. And 17,000 years ago, if you look that until recently, they were saying, oh, humans in America 12,000 years ago. But no, you know, I think this 17,000 is fine. Although, that would put the entrance of humans into North America hard to calculate. But you figure these guys were in a race to get down there. So pr probably, probably easy 20,000 years ago uh, that humans entered the Americas. There are some dates that have come out recently, like just out of San Diego, where they are saying 30,000 years ago. But it's, that's kind of has a lot of problems with it. Number one, that at that time, it was impossible to cross the Bering Straits by, by, by land. You would have had to, to have a boat. And we, we really don't have any clue as to when navigation started. So I, I, that date of 34,000 or whatever it is, I don't think so. It's, it's not. And the way that the bones are broken, they, uh, they are not broken like as if there were humans breaking the bones to extract the marrow. If they have broken because of accidents or whatever, they crack longwise like that. So I, I don't think so. But I think this of Nanchok at 8,000, and this is to make it more believable that it is human use, the, this is a section that it is a high production of lime that is used for chewing coca. So that, I think, is really good. And then if you come down the Peruvian coast, there is a, a site called Asia over here where they have also found coca in association with lime as well. And then when you come down here, the border with Chile and Peru let me not fall like Luis Eduardo did the other day. <laughs> uh, here, the border between Chile and Peru is more or less over here. So this side of Alto Ramirez is just right in the Chilean side of the border. 
And there is, is a, there are radiocarbon dates that take it to, you know, 3,000 years ago. Let me have the next one. So you see there, this is one of the humans. Look at the quid of coca that he had in his mouth. Wow. Yeah. It's blue like that because it's a region of copper production. So he's, uh, he's got copper stains on him. But that, and sometimes in Arica, in the, there are mummies that it seems that the coca quid was introduced after death. So they, didn't have it. So they have it like complete uh, stuck in there. But look at, the, at this man, you know, he has this. This is a photo courtesy of Mario Rivera, who is an archaeologist. At, works in the, in the north of Chile. There are rivers there, the Valle de Azapa, that they come down to the coast where they also found the oldest mummies in the world. Not dried up bodies, but actual modified bodies. Uh, in this uh, uh, chinchorro mummies, as they are called. They hold children and adult males and adult females, highly modified. It's more, they become more like a sculpture than a, than a mummy. Really, it's the body has been modified. Sticks have been stuck to replace bones, and they have uh, clay mask faces. It's a really interesting area of the world. Next one. So this is three thousand years ago. Uh, now, a Kogi man using poporo is what Colombians call the this gourds where you put the alkaline powder to shoe, and you get the stick, you wet it, and you have your quid. This is, sounds easier than it is. And then you put the stick in the thing, and you take it out full of the powder, and you rotate it against your quid. But I don't think, you know, it's, it's Not so easy. Eh? Not, so easy. Not, so easy. Not so easy. So, and then what happens is that the many of the elders, they clean the stick in the edge of the gourd, and then over years, it, it solidifies like cement. So they start, they carve it, and they give it different shapes. Sometimes like this, sometimes it's more like a, like a disc on the top. And the, yeah. so next one. Okay, this is one we found in San Pedro de Atacama, about 700 AD, and uh, this is, for us, this was such a thrill. We, we found this, and this is tiny. Uh, the, that, the, the figure is wearing a copper mask, has uh, turquoise ears, and the thing was stuck in a snail shell like that. So we started opening and pulling the snail shell, and this thing came out. Everybody in the room went, whoa. This, it was kind of thrilling for all of us to, to find that. It was one of those moments that when you excavate something and then this comes up, you say, well, this is kind of an event of, in one's life when this happens like this. But this is about, the total length of this pin is about like this, so you can figure that this little face is just like this. You know, yeah, really a little wonder of a thing. So first I wanted, next one, I wanted to, next one, I wanted to show you the, Colombians' implements from the Quimbaya culture. But let me, these are in the Museo de America in Madrid. It's really worthwhile a visit to this museum if you are in Madrid. They have the whole Quimbaya treasure, the Tesoro Quimbaya, as they call it. I'll show you in a map where it's located. So it happens that in 1890, 1891, they found these two burials in a place called La Soledad in, uh, in, in central Colombia. And then there were 122 gold objects, wonderful gold objects. Uh, and they, the Queen of Spain, Queen Regent of Spain, Maria Cristina, was being a, an arbiter in a dispute of the border with Colombia and Venezuela. The Queen ruled in favor of Colombia. So the president of Colombia at that time, the guy by the last name of Olguin, decided to give this new find of 122 gold objects to the Queen of Spain. So this object was sent to Spain, but it traveled around. It went, I think it went to the Colombian exhibition in Chicago and other places, and now it's there. The Colombian government now wants it back, but since it was given 
legally, I don't know, he was legally given by the president of Colombia to the Queen of Spain, I think they're going to have difficulty getting this back because it wasn't, a, it wasn't an outright robbery. One, you know, one could think it was a bribe to the Queen to have in fa uh, uh, be in favor of this, but anyway, it's there, it's worthwhile a visit uh, to this museum. It's not the greatest museum. Its exhibits are a little twisted, if you want to call it that, because they, they have a lot of Christian artifacts mixed with the pre-Columbian ones, so it's a little bit offensive. <laughs> in the to a colonial uh, in this colonial attitude that it has, but it's really worthwhile to visit just because of this uh, the Tesoro Quimbaya. Okay, so these are the the pins that they have. Let me have another shot of this. This is more Kalima culture, a little bit more south, close to the San Agustin culture. If you've never heard about San Agustin, it's a site that has over 300 pieces of sculpture scattered over an area. I don't know, I would say about 100 miles, square miles of terrain. Uh, the sculptures are scattered over the landscape because they were in, associated with mounds. And for many times it was a bad area to go to, uh, but it is a beautiful, important area of Colombia because right there in the Paramo, they have the headwaters of the Magdalena, you have the headwaters of the Cauca, the river that are the two main rivers that flow in Colombia. So they were in a really strategic location. So if you're in Colombia, going to San Agustin is really, is a great place. I did my master's thesis there, and it was one well, of the best place to, to do, uh, the better library to conduct research, it was there. So, but there the sculptures sometimes look at, see how similar they are to the, to the pins of, of chewing coca. Yeah. Next one, please. Okay, this is the Kimbaya area. This is, uh, how can I say it would be the best way to locate this? But this is the Chocó, this is Medellín over here, and most of the Kimbaya objects are in, in this area. They are, let me have the next one. They, go to the previous one again, please, I'm sorry. These are objects that are made with a lost wax technique. So realize lost wax, if, if you're not familiar with it, you make the figure with wax. You make it as, as perfect as you want the end product to be. So then you get this sculpture that you have made with wax and you encase it gradually in, with a fine coat of clay so that it gets all the details. And then you put thicker clay until you have a thing and in the clay you have put also, in the wax, I'm sorry, you have put sort of conduits so that the wax will fall out. So then you heat it up and the wax comes out, leaving a space in there that is that. So then you take your molten metal and pour it, and it occupies, if you're doing a good job, it occupies all the spaces that the wax left open. Okay. So the, the thing is that you, you gotta make the sculpture in a way that it flows because you're not gonna make it so that when you pull the metal, the metal is going to have to flow back. You know, so it's, it, it has its characteristic. And then when the metal solidifies, you crack the mold. So even if they are mold made, they are unique objects. They, they, are, not, uh, they are not copies made in a cast one after the other. So these are unique objects. Uh, this is a female figure. Uh, it has the hole to put the pin up here to get the sign sitting in a platform. And this is very common, these kinds of things they hold, like some kind of vegetable representation. Let me have the next one. Yeah, see? And they are really wonderful objects. Look at the detail of this, that the person with his poporo hanging in the neck even has the separation here. This, this was a master uh, caster that this is saying, you know. Yeah. Uh, there, I would say, there are as many males as females. You know, let me have the next one. Yeah, and some are, there are different varieties. Some are more sculptural like the previous one. This is more like a flask, it's flat, uh, like our flask of drinking that people put in their pocket. Okay. And uh, is, some are, uh, this was as a, this is two different ones. And this has a female figure on each side. The other one is blank. Let me have the next one. 
Yeah, and then this is another one of these, it's two sides. This is in New York City, in the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, I don't have a clue how this got to the Metropolitan, but you can figure out. Uh, let me have the next slide so you see another aspect of it. See? So I, I just thought that these are like wonderful objects. They, they, are, they convey the pleasurable qualities of chewing coke, from my point of view. Yeah, let me have another one. Okay. Look at this. Look at the, the incredible posture of this woman, you know, seated on a bench. Uh, in, in, the, in the Museo de America, they say she's pregnant. She might just have a big belly. <laughs> but really beautiful. It's see, and this has the, the still the rings to probably use it as a pendant. Okay. Now, you can imagine this, this person that is wearing this gold coming out into a ritualized situation where there is fire going on, the whole shimmering that would occur is probably an event on itself, the actual wearing of these things and seeing them. Next one. Yeah. Look. The, to me, and this is not that I'm one, but if you have seen the sculpture, uh, Cambodian sculptures like Angkor Wat, for example, mm -hmm. it has many similarities with this kind of things. I'm not by any stress saying that Cambodians came here or Kimbayans went to Cambodia. Uh, it's just a parallel. These are both tropical areas. There might be something going on there. Let me have the next one. Look, and some resemble vegetable squashes. Like this one is the most famous. This was part of a Colombian bill. I don't remember how many pesos it was, but it was part of a, maybe the 100 peso bill. I don't remember, but it's, it's okay. And then you open this thing to load it with a with the lime, and it has a th thing inside. But look how fine this thing is. Yeah. Next one. Okay, now let's go a little further south and see another kind of representation of coca related thing. This little culture here that occupies the border here called Capuli has what is the most common widespread representations. Next, that is the people holding the, the quid and the cheek is distended. Okay. Uh, I should mention here that, as far as I know, coca leaves are never represented in any object. They're not even painted like in mochi or Nazca ceramics. No, the coca leaves are not. Uh, they, and in, like in San Pedro de Atacama, where we find the sticks with the Egypt and stuff, we have never found coca in a burial. Never. I mean, I guess it's hard to say why. But we never found coca leaves in a burial. We have found the sticks like what I show you, but not that. So this is the person with the distended cheek. I mean, and this is, in a way, this is not an exaggeration. I've seen the, this chaman that we work with in the Chaco. He, we, he has a quid so big that you, you can see it. From when he talks to you, it protrudes out. Because some people, this, when the quid gets, how can you say? When the quid loses its flavor, like when chewing gum loses its flavor, some people dispose of them properly, but some people just keep adding, <laughs> keep adding without throwing the, the one that has, that has, I don't know, that has gotten cold, if you want to call it that, and they keep putting on and putting on. And this man sometimes looks like, you know, those photos of Dizzy Gillespie people in the trumpet, like so, you know. Okay, next one, then, it's another one. This is about, this in the Museo in Santiago, in, in, uh, this is in Santiago in the Museo, in the Museum of Pre-Columbian Art. This, they label it as a mask. It's the size of a, that a mask would be. But there is, uh, and it has these little holes here, see, that perhaps it was. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Another one, look at this guy, what an ecstatic position this individual is on. I mean, people, when my experience, when chewing coca for long hours, it, it's, it's a very ecstatic experience. You know, one, I'll tell you a quick story. One time we were, we were driving out to the Chaco and the driver made a mistake. And 
when we got to an interception that he should have gone left, he went right and he went in the direction of the city of Tucumán. And we had like a big bag of coca. <laughs> and we kept chewing along the way. It was me and Donna and Christian Rash, who some of you might probably know. And Christian is a great, great conversationalist <laughs> and a storyteller. So we, st and then, so we went and lost in our conversation chewing coca. And we told the driver, hey, you're wrong. We didn't recognize the, the, the direction he was going. So we finally turned around and we stopped like at one in the morning in a convenience store. That, and we went in there and there was fluorescent lights. You know, when they get bad, they kind of shimmer around. And so we entered into this convenience store while the driver got gas and the, the guy behind the counter had a huge quid like this. And we, it was like, a, wow. Uh, it, it was yeah, like a big hallucination thing that we were witnessing with the color of the light or the fluorescence and stuff. So it, it is deep effects that you can get with it, you know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so you look at this guy, wow. Next one. Another one. It is e equal women and men in this representation of the Capuli. Okay, next one. Yeah. Mm. I'm moving because I know you're all tired, so. So, next one. Then let's go to the moche. We're coming down, and we're coming south like this. Remember Ecuador, it's, it's over here somewhere, you know. And then the moche territory, it's right here with the concentration of, of moche. All the cultures were surviving here, like Biru, for example, the people of the Casma Valley or Warme. So there were mostly Sipan, the famous Sipan that a few years, like a couple of decades ago, was, was they found these really rich burials uh, uh, with a lot of gold and fancy objects in it. Okay, let me, so let me have the next one. Okay, see, look at this painted representation of a coca ceremony. You have, well, this is it, both, both sides of the thing. So you see the poporos here, these people putting the sticks in their mouth, holding the poporos <laughs> here, uh, and then this two-headed two -headed monster. And always with this moche coca representations, you have all of these uh, circular things floating around. And this, see this bag that, to me, it's like the representation of a, of a, of a bat, a murcielago bags, and which is, so the, now what, how can you read this? But you, you, it's the basic thing of coca that I was telling you, how it promotes conversation. So these two individuals in front of this bundle, whatever it is, that seems to have legs or feet, as you say, Okay, next one is another one of these. See, this is another one of these uh, moche ceramic vessels depicting a coca ceremony. You see the same bags hanging from the waist of the guy, another bag here with a poporo inside the bag, and another floating around, and everybody chewing coca along the way. So there are, there are many of these uh, moche, moche ceramic painted pots are abundant. I would say. We have the next one. Yeah. And these are two that are in the collection of the Dumbarton Oaks Museum in Washington, D.C. If you have never been to this place, when you visit Washington, D.C., do visit this museum. They, they, it's a museum of art of mostly jewels. Dumbarton Oaks is an interesting place. The building itself has a big garden, and this is where the, the charter of the UN was first signed. And uh, so again, you see the guys, one after the other, holding the poporos in their hand, and then the main, and the same bags, and then the main guy with this two-headed uh, snake, two-headed monster, if you can say, and all the circles. Uh, here, the little llamas. It's funny because the cargo is being carried by the human being, <laughs> not by the llama in this case. And the little poporos, this one that, if it wasn't because of the presence of the other poporos, you could say, oh, he's holding a mushroom. But this is a very dry desert coast. Uh, okay. Then this are like this we just saw a minute ago. Uh, yeah, beautiful things. 
Okay, ne next one, please. Then this one look uh, really impressive kinds of things. This is in the Larco Museum in Lima. Again, uh, talking about museums, if you go to Lima, this is a museum not to be missed. It's, the last thing about the Larco is that the, you have the exhibition area, but then you have that the, the storage areas are open. So you can go in there and see the, the shelves loaded with hundreds of parts uh, that, that you have access to. Uh, to walk among them, like if it was part of the exhibition area, which it is part of the exhibition area, but most museums, most museums close the exhibition areas and no access to the public. The Largo has it. You know. yeah. Next one. Yeah. See. Next one. Right. This is probably part of a. You know how in the today in the San Pedro mesas, they have these staffs that line the back of the mesa. This was probably the top of one of those. This is about like, it's about like this, this size. And uh, of course the, the staff is no longer present. Okay, next one, we're almost done. So about, uh, the, apart from the moshe, I wanted to show you a couple of things, uh, but this is again, it's a fragment of a stone bench from Tiwanaco that has to coca shores. Uh, remember, Tiwanaku is high up there, but it has easy access to, to the yungas of Bolivia, where a lot of coca is produced today. So it was uh, no big effort to trade coca up to the Altiplano. Okay. Next one. Okay, another one of these, a stone vessel with a coca shore. Another one. Okay, and this is, this is something remarkable. This is a style of ceramics that has been found in the, in the island of Pariti, in, in Lake Titicaca. And there, there is this style that is of ceramics that is localized to the island. It's, it's being excavated by Swedish, Finnish archaeologists. What's the name of the island? Uh, Par 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 and, and there is, they made a little museum in the island. And it has this style, which also speaks about Tiwanaku's tolerance for other artistic styles, because this has, if you look at the Tiwanaku sculpture, for example, this has no, no apparent connection to it. And Tiwanaku is right there uh, uh, from this, uh, 30 miles away maybe. And so this all distinctive style is being developed in that island in, in, in Pariti. It, you have to access it by boat. Of course, there's no bridges or whatever. But Lake Titicaca is among the most interesting. You have the, the island of the sun, the island of the moon, with uh, offering locations uh, the, of several thousand years of constant offering. Yeah. Okay, next one. And that's it. Okay, so I just wanted to <coughs> convey to you this idea of pleasure that I think is integral to, to coca chewing. Uh, it's, and I guess it's the attractive to cocaine, you know, uh, is, is the sense of pleasure that people receive from a snorting coke. You might have a lot of difficulties afterwards or whatever, but it's undeniable that coca is associated with pleasurable moments. That it's like, I don't know, and I don't want to, people emphasize this kind of sacred reverence if you want to call it that, that it's really more, I think, it's a prejudice from our own types of worship, Christian worship, for example, that you go to church and you, you know, and you, and rather than, than this kind of exotic overflow of, of, of passion, really, if you want to call it that, that, that is lacking in, 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 let's say, in, in Christian churches. I mean, I grew up a Catholic. I, I was an altar boy for, for a few years of my elementary life. And, you know, there was never, you know, yeah, there was never a, an ex, a, a rush of exotic pleasure. It was always this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you think? So I, I like to emphasize that part of it. So, well, anyway, I know you're all tired. Let's, at least, let's meet with. <laughs> Thank you.